Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Rise up and spend some time in prayer. As you have come to the Bible study today, I want you to present yourself before the Lord. That the Lord himself will teach you his word. That you have a receptive heart. And that the word of God will be acceptable to you. You'll be receptive of that word. It will do good in your life. It will move you forward in obedience to the word. Obedience to the Lord himself. Pray that the Lord will give you a serious mind, a spiritual attitude, a yielded disposition to the word of God, and that you will behave like a matured person, wanting to get the benefit of the word of God. Pray that the word will shape on your life, sharp on you too, and make you sensitive to the leading of the Lord and the direction in which he wants you to go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of our Bible study tonight. Thank you because of all those who are joining in and they are listening to the word, either through satellite or internet, here in Lagos, there all over Nigeria and in Africa and beyond. We are praying, O oh Lord, the study of the word will make us better in the things of the Lord, even from tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We are praying that your name will be glorified. Amen. You will be exalted. Amen. It will be the burden of our, the desire of our heart, that we glorify you more and more as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, not to belittle your word. Amen. And not to be so familiar with your word, we take things for granted. But that, Lord, we take everything you are teaching us seriously in Jesus' name. Amen. That, Lord, as we pray, on the word, wanting to be everything you want us to be, we will do good in this life. Amen. Will be a benefit, tremendous benefit to many people around us. Amen. That our lives will be useful as chosen, useful vessels in your hand. In Jesus' name, we well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We come to our Bible study today. Last week, we started from the book of Jonah. And if you were at the Bible study last week, open your Bible to Jonah chapter 1. You'll remember that I told you that Jonah means a dome. And it's a representation of every Christian. Yes, Jonah was an historical figure. He actually lived at a moment of time. And he prophesied among the children of Israel. But then the Lord sent him to go to Nineveh. That he will carry his evangelistic ministry, missionary ministry, and the preaching work all to Nineveh as well. Then we saw the attitude that he had. Let me read with you Jonah chapter 1 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. As a prophet, the word of the Lord came unto him. And you as a child of God, the word of God is coming to you today. And then we're told that he was the son of Amittai. And I told you last week that word Amittai, the name Amittai means the truth. Or my truth. That means a dove and the son of the truth. 
which means then we as children of God were children of light and children of the truth and we belong to the truth and the truth belongs to us and we take that truth and we go to share with all the people with people around us the commandment of the Lord came in us to arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me it was, the Lord was sending him to Nineveh. What kind of city was Nineveh? In Genesis chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 11 and verse 12. Genesis chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 11. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, the city Rehoboth and, Ga and Kala. And risen between Nineveh and Kala, the same as a great city. Number one thing you understand about Nineveh, it was an ancient city. A city that had been there from the time of Genesis, that obviously was an ancient city. And then in 2 Kings chapter 19, 2 Kings chapter 19, we're looking at verse 35. We're looking at this city that the Lord sent Jonah. And then we're going to look at his reaction later in 2 Kings chapter 19, reading from verse 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred and four score and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses, 36, and Sennacherib. The king of Assyria departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. It was an Assyrian city. Number one, an ancient city. Number two, an Assyrian city. But this city were told of in Nahum, Nahum chapter 1. There we read in verse 1 and verse 2, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the El Kushite. God is jealous and, the, and he revenges. The Lord revenges and the Lord revenges and, fear, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. It was the adversary's city. That means they were adverse to the Lord. They were enemies of the Lord. They were opposed to the Lord. A city of adversaries. In Nahum chapter 2. Nahum chapter 2. I'm reading from verses 8 and 9. But Nineveh is of old like a pool of water. Yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry. But none shall look back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store, and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. It was an, ador an adorned city, adorned with gold, adorned with silver, an ancient city, an Assyrian city, the adversary city, and the adorned city, chapter 3 of Nehum, I'm reading from verse 1. What to the bloody city? It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Verse 6. And I will cast abominable fields upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazes stone. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste, who will bemoan her? Whence shall I see comforters for thee? An abominable city. A lot of abominations in that city because of their wickedness and because of their cruelty and because of the sin in their midst in Sephaniah chapter 2. Sephaniah chapter 2, we're looking at verse 13, and then we'll jump down to verse 15. Sephaniah chapter 2, verse 13. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, and destroy Assyria, and will make Nineveh a desolation, 
and dry like a wilderness. Verse 15, this is a rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in a, in a heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How will she become a desolation, a place of bees to lie down in? Everyone that passeth by her shall his and wag his hand. An adventurous city, just adventurous, careless. That means carefree. And then not only that, an abandoned city eventually will be abandoned. And if the city was a real city, then Jonah himself was a real man, was a real prophet that the Lord sent unto Nineveh. And he said, Arise and go to Nineveh and cry against that city because their wickedness has come up before me. Then we read in verse 3 of chapter 1, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down. The Lord wanted him to do something. I told you last week, number one, the Lord wanted him to warn the people. Number two, the Lord wanted him to wake up the people. They were slumbering in sin. They were sleeping in sin. And it was like life will never end because of all the pollutions and all the, all the pomp and the, and the merriment that, there was, that were going on there. But it was to wake them up. Number three, it was to walk on them by the declaration of the judgment of God. Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. They were to wake up while walking on them. Then he wanted to withdraw them from the path of self-destruction. That's why he was sent to them. And then number five, he was to witness to them. He was to win them, number six. And then number seven, he was to watch over them. That in his message, he'll give them the message, welcome them into the kingdom. Then watch over them, that they don't go back into their pollutions anymore. What we're looking at today, you'll discover something. What Jonah was to do for the people of Nineveh, the Lord was not doing for him. The Lord sent all this to him, what we're going to look at today. Number one, to warn him. Number two, to wake him up. And the same thing the Lord is doing for Christians, believers today. There are some things He permits in our lives. Number one, to warn us that if we do not come back to the path of obedience, the warning is coming. That judgment will eventually come. The judgment comes in a moderate way today. But then in the future, it's going to be a devastating judgment, except we come back to the Lord, except we turn around and we're obedient to the Lord and we we'll say, Hey, Lord, I'm sorry for my going in the path of disobedience. Now I yield myself to you. The Lord wants us, number two, He wakes us up. Did you see that Jonah was sleeping? Even though he was living in disobedience and rebellion, and yet was fast asleep when the storm eventually came. And the Lord used one of the sailors' mariners there to wake him up. And the Lord was actually working on him. He was working on him. He wanted to turn him around, that he will go in the right direction he ought to go. And he used a storm. And he used the whale, and he used everything, the experiences that he went through, to work on him. And the Lord was working on him to withdraw him from the path of self-destruction. The backslider is treading, is going in the path of self-destruction. And the things the Lord allows in our lives will be to withdraw us from the path of destruction. And the Lord never leaves himself without a witness. He controls the sea. He controls the land. He controls the wind. He controls everything. And all these things come together to still witness to us that God is still on the throne. And eventually is to win our hearts to him. And it's because he's watching over us. If he wasn't watching over us, we could go any direction. We could do anything. We could attempt anything. And even go away from the Lord and nothing will happen. But because the Lord is watching over us, that's why those things happen. So that we can be brought back to the place we ought to be. Now, Jonah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. But the Lord sent, not Satan, the Lord himself, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. 
Then the mariners were afraid, and he cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten each of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And he said, Everyone to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thy occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what, and of what uh, people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. Which, may, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee? That the sea may become unto us. For the sea, uh, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea become unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring ye to the, to the land. But they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore? He cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou art, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. You see in the story we have read concerning Jonah, that God was after him, and God raised up a storm after him. And you see the title of the topic that we are looking at tonight, the storm with a positive purpose. Everything God does, he does on purpose. He has a reason for doing whatever he does. Anything he permits in your life, anything he permits in my life, God has a reason. God has a purpose. And in the case of Jonah, God had a purpose for permitting the storm, not even permitting only, sending the storm upon the sea. It was the love of God that will not leave Jonah alone, that wanted to walk on him, and he wanted him to do the work, committed him to his son. That's why he sent the storm after him. He needed to win over the prophet so that he can use him to win the people who are living contrary to his will. As we read about the storm that assailed the Tashish-bound ship, with Jonah on board, there is on the one hand human interpretation. The human interpretation is this is bad. How can something like this come upon me? Why should something like this be upon me? Why should God send a storm like this? Human interpretation, all negative. But on the other hand, there's divine intention. The divine intention. And the divine intention is positive. God had a good thing in mind. Human interpretations are always, all, almost always different from the divine intention. While it can be said that the wrath of God was upon Jonah, the intention of God was not just to manifest his wrath or his anger or his indignation, but to recover Jonah from the path of disobedience, from the path of rebellion, from the path of self-destruction. When you look at the eye of the storm, 
you are likely to read divine frown. It's like God was angry and God was frowning at him. But when you look at the eyes of the Almighty God and look very deep into the heart of God, into the mind of God, you'll see not divine frown, but divine favor. Everything God does and everything God permits in the life of his own child is out of deep eternal love. That's what we're looking at today in this uh, chapter, the first chapter of Jonah. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, a discipline of love. A discipline of love. Number two, the disruption of lives. The disruption of lives lives then number three devotion to the lord let's come back to number one a discipline of love i'm reading once again jonah chapter one verse three verse four rather jonah chapter one verse four but the lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken Storm came into Jonah's life, and it was to make him rather than to mar him. As you look at the things that come upon our lives, you look at the things that assail us in this life. If we are children of God, the conclusion we make is the conclusion of Scripture. That all things work together for good to them, for them who are called of God, those who are called according to his purpose. When a storm comes like that, I mean the scriptures to you now, let me just uh, tell you what happens. Number one, the heart is melted. You know, man becomes fearful. It's like the end has come. It's like, what are we going to do? And you see, I read the story to you. They were using their hands to throw their property into the sea. Their heart was melted because storms melt us. And the discipline of love coming from the hands of God, number one, is to melt us. Number two, is to mold us. You see, God has told us the story in a parable, in a, in the way of a parable. He said, hey, Jeremiah, I want to show you something. Go to the house of the porter. And then when you get there, I'll be telling you what I want to tell you. And then Jeremiah went there and he saw the porter molding a vessel. It became marge. It became spoiled in his son. And then he broke it down. And then he molded it again onto another vessel. Number one, the storms in our lives is to melt us down. Number two, is to mold us. Number three, is to mend our lives. Without those storms, without those corrections, and without the discipline of love from the Lord, will not grow properly. There will be many errors and many faults and many terrible things in our lives. Evil sin will come in without any check. But he allows the storm so that he can manage our lives. And yet, while the storm is there, the Lord is monitoring. He says the storm and he monitors us. He monitors us. What does that mean? He was watching Jonah. When the storm came, he was monitoring him. He was sleeping there. He wasn't waking up. It wasn't affected by the storm. It said, God, do all you want to do. I'm still all right. In fact, I can, I can take my rest. You see, the Lord monitors us when he disciplines us. In a discipline of love, in the storm that come into our, that storms that come to our lives, the Lord monitors us. And eventually, when they said, what are we going to The storm went on. The storm went on in the life of Jonah. And on the ship where Jonah was, because the Lord was monitoring, there was no change. There was no change of heart. There was no repentance. And therefore, the Lord made the storm to continue. And the Lord was, I was hearing their discussion. What are we going to do to you, Jonah? So that this storm will come to an end. Oh, he said, what you are going to do? Throw me into the, into the sea. If you throw me into the sea for you, everything will be all right. Then I will continue with the Lord. And they throw him into the sea. And then the storm stopped for them. And then God continued with Jonah. Because, you see, it's not going to leave you alone until he finishes with you completely. Because, actually, he is our mentor. Mentoring. You see, the storm 
It's part of the process of the Lord to mentor you, to develop you, and to raise you up, and to make you the man or the woman that you ought to be. Without that mentoring and without that change, of course, you are going to go the wrong direction. But the Lord was watching. He was watching the effect of the storm on that Jonah. Eventually, you'll come out and then you are mature. The storm, storms actually mature us. Difficulties mature us. The storms of life, the discipline of life, they are supposed to mature us and make us to be the man or the woman, the minister, the soul winner, the Christian that we ought to be. Then number seven is to multiply the fruit of righteousness in your life. You see, when the storms come, at the beginning, you are so childish. At the beginning, you might even be rebellious. At the beginning, you might be very disobedient and say, well, God, go on. I'm still going to go my own way. But the Lord keeps on monitoring and mentoring. And he keeps on maturing you until you come to the point that now you are matured because of the storm. And then he multiplies the fruit of righteousness in your life. I pray that whatever the Lord is sending your life now, and whatever the Lord is doing in your life, it will mature you. I said it will mature you. And all that, everything I told you now, from the melting to the molding to the mending to the monitoring and to the mentoring, as well as to the maturing, as well as to the making eventually or, or monitor, doing everything eventually, to make you, not to mar you, not to destroy you, but to make you the man and make you the woman that you ought to be. And the Lord will finalize and effect that purpose in your life in Jesus' name. And let's look at scriptures and let's look at Psalm 48. In Psalm 48, I'm reading to you from verse 5. You see the effect of the storm. When the storm eventually comes. In Psalm 48, I'm reading from verse 5. They saw it. So they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. They took hold upon them there and pain as of a woman in travail. Thou breakest the sheep of Tarshish with an east wind. And as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. You see what the Lord does there? is to establish us, to establish us in the truth, to establish us in the way of righteousness, and yet you see the sheep that is going the way of Tarshish, and then it sends the storm. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple, according to thy name, O God. So is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. All that discipline was because of the righteous act of the Lord. And so what I'm telling you is, when the storm comes in your life, when difficulties come in your life, when challenges come in your life, all those challenges, all those storms, they are the method of the Lord to bring you under some check, under some control, under some discipline, so that your heart is melted, and then you are molded, and then you are led in the right direction. Psalm 107. In Psalm 107, I'm reading from verse 23. Psalm 107, verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth up the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. You see, this is the work of the Lord. Because he wants to bring discipline upon the man, because he wants to bring some checks, some control upon the man, he, the almighty God, raiseth up the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. In verse 26, they mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths, to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. That's what I was telling you. That the trouble, the discipline, the storm melts the soul. They reel to and fro, stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. They, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof 
are still. And then he tells us in verse 30, then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired heaven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works of the children of men. You see, God uses the storm. He uses the wind. He uses the waves. He uses the discipline. He uses the trouble so that it, the, the hearts of men can be bowed down and bent towards the will of God. Psalm 94. In Psalm 94, I'm reading from verse 10. He that, chast he that chastises the heathen shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge shall he not know? The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. All that Jonah was thinking about, the Lord knew that was thinking thoughts of vanity. And he wanted to bring him to the thoughts of sanity. And from vanity to sanity, there will be a storm. Before the Lord brings you to your correct senses, that this is the way to walk. And this is the way to go. He might correct the a foolishness. It might correct the sin. It might correct the fault with a storm. It tells us in verse 12, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. The chastening of the Lord and the discipline of the Lord and the storm that comes upon our lives many, many times that to teach us the way of the Lord. That thou mayest give rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. And then in verse 14, for the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in, in heart shall follow it. It tells us in Psalm 89, Psalm 89, I'm reading from verse 30. In Psalm 89, verse 30, if his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. I will visit their transgression with the rod. That's discipline. The rod of discipline. The storm of discipline. But it's the discipline of love. And their iniquity will I visit with stripes. That's the judgment of the Lord coming upon the people that do not remain at the center of the perfect will of God for them. Jonah knew what it was to be done. Jonah knew the center of the will of God and then deliberately, intentionally, he deviated from that. And then the Lord sent a storm in verse 33. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will lie not utterly removed from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. He does all that, the discipline, the correction, the chastisement, he does everything in love. Psalm 119, Psalm 119. I'm reading from verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. And the affliction brought me back to the right path. The chastisement brought me back to the right path. The storm brought me back to the place I should have been. But before that storm, before that correction, before that chastisement, I went astray. And then he said, but now have I kept thy word. Verse 68, thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Good for me that I have been corrected, I have been chastised. Good for Jonah that the storm came upon it. Without that storm, he would have gone the wrong way, might have died in a foreign land. But then he said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, I've been chastised, I've been corrected. It's good for me that the stormy wind blew upon my ship, that I might learn thy statutes, thy law in verse 72, the law of thy mouth is better unto me now than thousands of gold and silver. And as a person that had stated of the chastisement of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3. In Proverbs chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 11. Proverbs chapter 3. We're looking at verse 11 and verse 12. My son, 
despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. My son, if you're a real child of God, you shouldn't be weary of the correction of the Lord, of the chastisement of the Lord. Neither be weary of his correction, for whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, even as a father, as a father, the son in whom he delighted. And because the Lord delights in us, if we're going astray, then he finds a way to bring us back. And that way of bringing us back might be through a storm, might be through some real challenging difficulties. Maybe be through some things you couldn't handle by yourself because the Lord will lay the storm on the disobedient child to force that child to come back home and to pray unto the Lord and to be yielded unto the Lord. The reason the Lord sometimes engages in a struggle with us when we are minded to go our own way is because he knows that if he allows us to do what we want, our lives will not be profitable to us our lives will not be profitable to our community. Our lives will not be profitable to our country or to our generation. In God's display of displeasure against Jonah, we we'll see his love trying to bring him back to fulfill his call. A call of God is upon your life if you are a child of God because he has called you to be a soul winner. He has called you to be a preacher. He has called you to be a minister. He has called you to be a worker in the vineyard of the Lord. Great rewards await those who will do it willingly. As a proof of his divine love, we find the Lord always taking the initiative. You see that all through Jonah's ordeals, the Lord took initiative. And then the discipline came and the Lord brought him back. And if any of us is going astray, in his own way, a wonderful way, but sometimes hard, tough way, the Lord will bring us back in Jesus' name. Amen. We even do that in our families. When you find your child going astray, don't you discipline your children? Don't you correct your children? Don't you sometimes even have to lay some stripes on your children? We're told in Proverbs 13, Proverbs Chapter 13, verse 24. He that speareth his rod, hateth his son. He that speareth his rod, hateth his son. But he that loveth him, chasteneth him betimes. If you are not following the scriptures, if you are following present day, modern day psychology. Present day psychology says you don't spank, you don't beat, you don't correct, you don't control. Let the child, the ch they say the child is creative. They don't understand that the child has an evil nature. They don't understand that the same principle is in every child. In fact, in everyone, until you are saved, until you are sanctified, the evil nature is there. The propensity to do evil is there. But psychology will tell you that everyone is good, naturally good, normally good. That is your environment that actually makes you to go the wrong direction. And what the teacher, you know, the managers and the directors, if you go for such a seminars, they teach you that actually it's commendation all the time. And never give condemnation. Never say, why did you do that? Why did you do that? That everybody has a reason for doing whatever he does. And therefore, the thing is to be positive. Don't have a negative attitude. Don't correct anybody. Let them go their way. In fact, they say you might discover that you think somebody is making a mistake. And what he what you call a mistake might turn out to be a creative method of doing something you never thought of. That's the way they teach them. But the Bible is different. God is different. And when Jonah was doing what he was doing, God corrected him. And if we're children of God, God corrects us. And in the church, we don't follow psychology, we follow the scripture. We follow the word of God. It says in this verse 24, He that speareth his rod, hateth his son, but he that loveth him, chasteneth him betimes. You'll correct your children. In fact, you'll correct the brethren. You'll correct one another if you love one another. And let's look at what the word of God is telling us in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, we're reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastineth. 
Therefore, we know that what came in the life of Jonah was the love of God. That wasn't hatred at all. Whom the Lord loveth, he chastineth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastineth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. For the more we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, that is, our earthly fathers, our parents, our leaders, in the natural, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the reason why the Lord allows the storm. That's the reason why the chastisement sometimes comes. That's why the correction sometimes comes. That's why the discipline of love sometimes comes. Because it says that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Please notice the last part of that sentence. It, it will be profitable for them who are exercised thereby. Now, it's not the day or it's not the moment that the storm began that Jonah responded appropriately. And sometimes it's like that when you are correcting your children. It's not the day that you start correcting your children that the children will respond positively. In fact, sometimes uh, the psychologists, that's what they capitalize on. The psychologists will tell you, okay, you've been correcting your children now. And since you've been spanking them and rebuking them, correcting them, has your correction brought any change? You answer no. Okay, if, as, if it has not brought any change, why don't you understand then that correction doesn't work? No, it works, but it takes time. It is not the day, it is not the moment the storm begins that the correction will come. Don't you see, Jonah, the storm began and he went to sleep. Even while the others were praying and crying to their God, he was still fast asleep. And when, when they woke him up and they said, this is a storm, do you know for whose reason this storm is raging? Yes, I know. How do you know? It's me. It's because I'm running away from God. What do you want to do then? Well, just throw me into the sea and I'm, I'm ready to die. You see, it's not the day or the moment that the discipline begins that will benefit thereby. And that's what the people are telling us. Since this thing is not working, why don't you stop it? Since this thing is not working, why don't you just erase it and go another way and take another method? No, it's going to work. It may not work in one day. It may not work in one month. It may not even work in one year. But keep on bringing your children and bring, keep on chastising your children and keep on correcting your children. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is when he's old, he will not depart from it. It will work one day. And I said it will work one day. And on Jonah, eventually it worked. And I pray that the hand of the Lord, the chastening of the Lord, will work in our lives in Jesus' name. No chastening for the moment, for the present, seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto those who are exercised thereby and we look at revelation chapter 3 verse 19 revelation chapter 3 verse 19 as many as i love i rebuke that's the lord jesus christ talking and he was talking from glory he was talking from heaven obviously you know that when jesus was here on earth it was wise, wiser than every other person, wiser than all the secular leaders today, and all the religious leaders today, and all the psychological leaders today. When Jesus Christ was on earth, it was wiser than all of them. And then when he's gone to heaven, the glorified Christ, saying from heaven, as many as I love, 
I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And then eventually, let's come back to Jonah now. As we come back to Jonah, let's see the attitude of Jonah. And let's see what actually transpired in between him and the mariners and the sailors. We're looking at Jonah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5 to verse 10. Jonah chapter 1, reading from verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and he cried every man to, unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten each of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And he said, Every one, and he, and he said, Every one to his, to his fellow. Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people are thou? Let me stop there for a moment. Why didn't they ask these questions at the beginning? You need to learn how to ask questions. Ask questions from people. Before you accept somebody into the boat of your life, ask questions. Before you allow anybody to take part in your very life, sharing your life, sharing your future with another person, ask questions. Before you say, okay, I'm giving my hand in marriage, you can come into my life, I can come into your life, and the two of us shall be riding the same boat to the destiny of our lives. Ask questions. Why didn't they ask these questions when Jonah came in? Why don't you ask questions when you're making some new friends, when you're having some new associates, when you're bringing some people into your business, when you're bringing some people into your family? Why didn't you ask those questions? Ask the questions at the beginning, not after you've gone through some real terrible time. They were asking questions there. They said, tell us, we pray thee. We're pleading with you. You must tell us the truth. From where are you? What's your occupation? Whence comest thou? What's your country? Of what people art thou? And then we're told in verse 9, And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of of the Lord, because he had told them. He said, actually, I'm running away from God. And then they became seriously afraid. You see, these sailors, they were exposed to danger because of the presence of Jonah in their ship. Uh, you know, there are times that people are running away from something. The Lord is laying upon them. Uh, you need to understand that God is still the same as he was before. As it was in the time of Moses, he had something for Moses to do. As it was in the time of Joshua, he had something for Joshua to do. As it was in the time of Elisha, you know, Elisha didn't even understand. Elisha was doing his normal business, daily routine. And then God told Elijah, he said, I have a man, his name is Elisha. And he's walking in such and such a place, you will go to him there. And when you get to him there, you throw the mantle on him because they don't want to take your place. And Elisha knew nothing. There are people that God has his hands upon. And then like Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before you were formed in the belly, I knew thee and I appointed thee, I anointed thee, I ordained thee to be a prophet to the nations. There are people like Saul of Tarsus that the Lord has his hand upon them. And there might be people today because God is still the same. I am God, I change not. And Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. God might be calling somebody and he knows. 
God might be laying some sin on somebody and he knows and then he's running away from that sin that the Lord is calling him to and then he runs to you, he runs it to your sheep and he says can we travel together? You say no problem and he has some money to pay you and you think you are going to get some benefit out of this joining together, affiliation together, association together and eventually he gets it to your boat and you get into trouble. Why don't you ask the questions before you have that association? That affiliation and that fellowship and that unity with them. And then sometimes maybe the Lord already, has, somebody has gotten married. And this fellow that has gotten married has left the wife somewhere. And he knows that the call of God is go back to that wife. That's your proper wife. That's your right wife. But the man runs away from there and comes into another place and another fellowship. And then he's asking for your hand in marriage. And you're not asking any question. And he happens to have some money. And because of that, you join your hand together in marriage. Of course, there's going to be trouble. And then it's after that trouble, you begin asking questions. Were you married before? Where are you coming from? Did you have any children before? All the questions you have asked at the beginning. Now you begin to ask when the trouble comes. I pray we'll be wiser. Amen. I said we'll be wiser. Amen. And you know it can happen to a whole church too. A whole church. That somebody has a call in his own denomination. And then he's running away from that call. Or maybe he's even under discipline in that other denomination. And then he runs to our church here. He's gone to Bible school, he's so ordained, he's this and that, and then he loves our church, that's why he has come to us. And he, and, and he doesn't care, even if you make him as fellowship leader, or just a coordinator, or even though he could have got a great position in his denomination, ask questions, ask questions. Don't just say, praise the Lord, he has come. And then you join affinity with him, and then you run the church into trouble. That's what happened to this man. He disrupted the lives of other people. Because of they not asking any question, he was living in disobedience. They became connected with this man in his rebellion, in his disobedience, in his path of self-destruction. And eventually, you see the thing that happened. And let's look, let's look at it. They wanted to find out by lots, by casting lots, on whose, on whose case. Why is this happening to us? We're looking at Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. In Proverbs 16, verse 33, the Lord is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And that is exactly what happened in the case of those marinas, those sailors. Well, the use of the Lord, and they even did it in the New Testament, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. Acts chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. Wherefore, of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with, from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Joseph called Basabas, who was so named Justus and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two, which of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots. That's it. That's exactly what they did when they wanted to find out for whose cause is this storm upon us. And then it says they gave their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. And it was numbered with the eleven apostles. And so God sometimes uses something like that. Eventually they discovered Jonah. A sin found him out. And the Lord is telling us today, it is still the same thing. If you're living in secret sin and you think nobody knows, there's a God in heaven that knows. And one day, it's going to expose all those things except you repent and turn completely unto the Lord. In Numbers chapter 32 verse 23. Numbers chapter 32 verse 23. But if ye will not do so, 
If ye will not do what you have committed yourself to, what you have promised your, your, the Lord that you will do, if ye will not do so, if you will not carry out the commandments of the Lord, if you will not carry out the will of the Lord, if you will not subject yourself, submit yourself to thus says the Lord, uh, the Moses was talking here uh, to the people, uh, Reuben, Gad, and had the tribe of Manasseh. They had promised that they would follow the children of Israel, the rest of them, into the land of Canaan. And then when they covered the land and conquered the land, then they will come back and take their possession. And then Moses told them, if you do what you have said, that will be wonderful. If you do as you have promised, as you have covenanted, or committed yourself to, or consecrated, that will be great. But if you don't, if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. And be sure that your sin will find you out. When Jonah joined them in that ship, nobody knew that he was doing anything wrong. He looked innocent and normal like everybody else. He appeared innocent and normal like everybody else. But the storm will come. The challenge will come. The chastening rod of the Lord will come. And the pressure from the Lord will come. And it's like he puts it into the pressure cooker. And eventually, as he melts you, eventually, as it touches the very center of your emotion, eventually the thing will come out. Be sure that your sin will find you out. But there was a lot of damage that was done. As you see what happened to all of them, as they cast their wares into the sea, one sinner destroys much, much good. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 18. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 18. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. One sinner destroys much good. You can see the presence of the sinner, the rebel, the disobedient, the self-willed, the stubborn man, Jonah, in that ship. They lost what they had got. They lost their peace. They lost their property as well. Because of the presence of one rebellious self-willed Jonah in that ship. Let me remind you of the story of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. In Joshua chapter 7 verse 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed sin. For Achan, the son of Kamai, the son of Zamdi, the son of Zerah, and of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed sin, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Just one man, one sinner, destroys much good. He can took what he took. He can did what he did. And then the anger of the Lord, the wrath of God, came upon the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So they went up thither of the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the children, before the men of Ai. And the, and the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even to Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. You see, because of the sin of Achan, thirty-six people died. One sinner destroys much good. Then he tells us, and Joshua in verse 6, rent his clothes and fell on the earth. 
upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide, and he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, so Lord God, wherefore as thou art all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has seen just one man, Achan. And then God said, Israel had sinned. Because, you see, you are not living in isolation. You have a web of relationships around you. And your life is connected with many other people. And just your own sin alone can get a lot of other people into trouble. That's why, for your own sake, avoid sin. For the sake of others, avoid sin. And because of the terrible consequence of your sin upon other people, if you went into sin and you were adamant in that sin, that's why you avoid sin. Not just because of yourself, because of other people too. Israel had sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their cursed sin, and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand. Just one Achan. And because of that one single Achan, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except she destroy the accursed sin from among you. Ah, oh, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed sin in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Joshua chapter 22. In Joshua chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 20. Joshua chapter 22, verse 20. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel? You see that? Achan, just one man, in the midst of the people, did he not sin? And did he not dissemble? Did he not disobey the Lord in taking of that accursed thing? And because of just the sin of Achan, wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel. And that man perished not alone in his iniquity. He perished not alone in his iniquity. That's the reason you ought to be very careful what you do. You ought to be very careful uh, how, you, how you run away from the perfect will of God for your life. In First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And Satan stood up against, against who? Israel. Not just David. But he provoked David. He was standing against Israel. He knew the principle. Satan knew the principle that if their king, if their leader will do something wrong, the wrath will come not just on the king, on David alone. It will come upon Israel. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Look at verse 14. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. Not just David alone. Upon Israel and their fell of Israel, 70,000 men because of the sin of David. And that means then, if you are a Jonah there, the Lord is calling you repent for your own sake and repent for the sake of others too. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 15, chapter, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, looking diligently, 
lest any man, just one man, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, just one man, and thereby many be defiled. After these people, uh, you know, tried all that they could do, and yet there was, there was no respite, and the storm still went on, then they cast Lot, and they discovered it was Lot, uh, sorry, it was uh, Jonah that was uh, at fault. And even though his theology was all right, he said, there's a God in heaven. He is the maker of the earth and the sea. And that's the reason why all this is against us. Now, the theology was all right, but spiritual life was not all right. We should not be just all right in our doctrine or in our theology. We should be all right in our deeds as well as in our behavior. I come to point number three, devotion to God. Devotion to God. I'm reading from verse 11 now. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. He said unto them, Take me up. And cast me forth into the sea. So, so shall the sea become unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring ye to the land. But they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, we plead with you, we pray unto you, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. You see, I'm going to divide that part, that uh, passage, to two parts. The first part you have from verse 11 to verse 13. Look at that. Verse 11 to verse 13. They had now discovered that Jonah was the reason the trouble was on them. And they wanted to know from Jonah himself. Since you are a prophet, you are a preacher, you are a servant of God. You know God more than we do. Now you can give a solution to this problem. What do you think we ought to do? Because now you've told us this trouble is coming upon us because of you. What are we going to do so that this sea raging will come to a calm? And then Jonah said, instead of Jonah saying, pray along with me. I want to repent. I know God answers prayer. I know that if I will repent here, God will have mercy on me. He'll have mercy on you. No, he wasn't ready for repentance. He was like fighting with his maker. And then he said, take me up and throw me into the sea. If you do that, then since I'm the cause of the problem, the sea will become for you. The people didn't want to do that, so they rode harder. And yet they harder they rode and sailed the more. The sea rode and was tempestuous against them. And let me show you something in the word of God concerning that Jeremiah chapter 2. In Jeremiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 30. Jeremiah chapter 2. We're looking at verse 30. And then you will see the attitude of Jonah painted in bright colors. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 30. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. God said, Israel, Judah, I have smitten your children. I have brought chastisement upon your children. I have corrected your children. I have disciplined your children. I have laid trouble on your children. But the trouble has not made them to repent. Je Jeremiah chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 3. O Lord... Had not thine eyes upon the truth, that was tricking them, but they have not grieved. That's the case of Jonah. That was the case of Jonah. That was tricking them, but they have not grieved. That was consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. You see, God wanted Jonah to return. God wanted Jonah to say, Lord, I surrender. 
I am sorry for my disobedience. I am sorry for my rebellion. But no, they would not repent. And Jonah too will not repent. In fact, what the correction did for these people of Judah is that it made their faces harder than a rock. That means they toughened themselves. And they were very, very stiff. And it's like, oh God, go ahead. We're ready for you. Now, if the correction of the Almighty God himself will not instantaneously, automatically change a man or change a nation, what do you think of the correction of a father or the correction of a mother? And you know, sometimes you are correcting your children and those children, that's why I told you, for the moment, it might appear that there is there's no change. And there's no transformation, but don't get tired. And that's what those children are waiting for, you know, especially our teenagers. They say, Daddy will be tired because you see all the beating, all the correction, all the Bible reading, all the denial. I'll deny you of this, I'll deny you of this. And, and the child just says, It's all right, I can do without those things. And as you are getting tough as a father, the teenager, the child is also getting tougher. And then you say, okay, there's no point. Discipline will never work anymore. No, it will work. It will take time, but it will work. Amen. I said it will work. Amen. For Jonah, if you read the story through, eventually it worked. By the time you get to chapter 2, Jonah knew that this God he has a lot of methods. When he stops using the wind and the wave and the storm, he can use the whale. He can use the fish. And if he can use the fish, he can still use other things too. And eventually, he surrendered. Let's look at Jeremiah again, chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 4. Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 4. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall they turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem leading back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearken and heard, but they speak not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his cause as the horse rushes into the battle. Yea, the stock in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. And the sword, the torture, and the crane, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. How do ye say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. Lo, certainly in vain made he eat. The pen of the scribes is in vain. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 8. Jeremiah 13, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus says the Lord, after this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem, this evil people which refuse to hear my words. The Lord not told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you understand why they are so adamant like that? It's because of pride. And then the Lord said, I'm going to bring that pride down. These people in verse 10, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and walk after, the, after other gods who serve them, and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. The Lord said, Judah, repent, because if you don't, eventually you are going to become good for nothing. Second Chronicles chapter 28. In 2 Chronicles chapter 28, we're looking at the attitude of Jonah. Adamantine rebellion and in his sin will not want to yield to the Lord. And it was very simple. Arise, go and preach unto Nineveh the preaching that I gave you. 2 Chronicles chapter 28 verse 22. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? In the time of his distress, in the time of the pressure, in the time of the storm, in the time of the chastisement, and in the time of the discipline, he trespassed yet more against the Lord. This is that king Ahaz. We're told in Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 11. 
Zechariah 7, verse 11. But they refused to hack him and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. They made their faces and their hearts like adamant stone, and they refused to repent because of that more judgment came on them in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, reading from verse 13. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them. The Lord smote them, but he didn't return. He chastised them, but he will not return. He sent his storm after Jonah, but he will not return. And he brought real heartache to this Jonah, but he will not return. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them. Neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Well, the Lord then gave up, as the psychologists tell us to give up. And the psychologists say, since that correction did not work in one day, and did not work in one week, why don't you give up? And then instead of rebuking the sinner, you appreciate the sinner. And you commend the sinner. And you commend the backslider. And the one that is destroying your company and tearing your corporation apart, if you are working in the secular world, they say that when they are doing that, they have a reason for doing that. There's always a reason for agitation. And therefore, find the root cause of the agitation. And instead of correcting them, instead of firing them, and instead of being negative to them, call their ringleader. And then interchange some words and fellowship with them. And send him back to the people that, well, we, have, we know that you people will not hear the voice of the management. We have heard what you have said. Now the management is going to bend low and, uh, you know, appeal to them. They say, that's what will work. But God doesn't do it like that. That even when the correction comes, when the chastisement comes, when the storm comes, if the people do not repent, look at verse 14. Therefore, the Lord will cut off from Israel hedge and tail, branch and rush in one day. More judgment God sends when there is no repentance. And now let's come now to the effect on those sailors, the effect on the mariners. We're looking at Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, I'm reading it now from verse 14. Jonah chapter 1 verse 14, therefore they cried unto the Lord. Do you see a difference there? Because say, earlier they cried unto their gods. Look at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid and cried everyone unto his God. Little g, the wide all worshippers. Because of what happened now, and because Jonah told them he was running away from God, these sailors, these mariners had more fear of God in them than even Jonah was supposed to be a servant of God. And so what they did, they cried unto the Lord, capital L. They cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. Nor lay, lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Now they had the fear of God. They had some knowledge of God now. In verse 15, so they took up Jonah and they cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased and raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered sacrifice, a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. This is like conversion. They knew the Lord through this unwilling missionary, unwilling preacher, unwilling soul winner. Now they knew there is a God in heaven. And they made vows unto that God, and they did sacrifice unto that God. Isaiah chapter 26 here is what they were telling the Lord. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading verse 13. O Lord our God, all the lords beside thee have had dominion over us. Those mariners could have said, we have been worshipping idols. All the lords have had dominion over us. There it says, but now. But by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They now made vows unto the Lord. And that's what happened to the um, Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
First Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 9. For they themselves show forth what manner of entering in we had unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They turned unto the Lord, and the Thessalonians turned unto the Lord. In the case of the Thessalonians, they had the word of God from Paul the Apostle, and these people turned. In the case of these mariners and sailors, they heard about God from Jonah. And uh, eventually they were turned from darkness unto light. And what Jonah should have done willingly. And what he should have done cheerfully. What he should have done under the mercy and the grace of God. Eventually he did it by force. We're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 26 verse 18. Acts 26 verse 18. To open their eyes. And to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. What lesson are we learning from Jonah? We're learning that we ought to obey the word of God promptly. We ought to obey the word of God while yet the favor of God is upon us. We ought to obey the word of God while the Lord is still saying, Arise, go to Nineveh and preach to that city and preach to that community and tell those people that they should turn unto the Lord. Let's come back to Jonah chapter 1. Here is the word of the Lord for you and for me. Chapter 1 verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. The Lord has appointed us to do something for him. We will do it. Amen. My being that is in the church, you are to lead us fellowship, you are to walk in the district, you are to walk in local government, or you are to walk in the region. Whatever the Lord has called us to, let's arise and do it. And there will be a reward for obedience to the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. And if any of us has been like Jonah, and you have said, no, I'm not going to do it. I will abandon the work of the Lord. The Lord's mercy is still available today. And his grace is still available today. And the Lord is still calling us back saying, the work is still there. The privilege is still there. The ministry is still there. And we'll respond and we're going to do it. Amen. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, if you have seen any storm in your life, don't blame God. If you have seen any chastisement in your life, don't blame God. If there has been any problem, any pressure, don't blame God. Is God at fault for the suffering of Jonah? No, not at all. It was Jonah's fault. And the Lord is telling you, you can call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not going to allow the storm to continue. I will not be hardened in my rebellion. I will not be hardened in my disobedience. I will not be hardened in my own selfish, self-willed way. I'm calling upon the Lord, oh Lord, have mercy upon me. I will do your will. Open your mouth and call upon the name of the Lord. If you're a backslider, you're a prodigal son, you're a prodigal daughter, the Lord is calling you back. Come back home. Come back home. Why are you going to wander away from the Lord? Why are you going to stay away from the Lord? Come back home and the favor of the Lord will be upon you. Talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord is calling you now. And the Lord wants you to come unto him. Yield your whole self, your whole will. Yield everything unto him. You have wandered away. Every hearted and sad you roam about. The sweet, gentle voice of the Lord is calling your wandering child. Come back home. Have you abandoned the work of the Lord? The soul winning. The intercession. The house fellowship. What the Lord has called you to do. Have you abandoned it? Are you deliberately going farther and farther and farther away from the assignment the Lord has, has given you to do? Why don't you just tell the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not going to allow this storm to increase in my life. I'm coming back home to you. What you have told me to do, I will do. And God has grace, abundance of grace for you to do what he has called you to do. Just say, Lord, I'm coming back home. Child, come back home. Walker, come back. Wandering child, why longer roam? It is your father who entreats you, who is pleading with you. Wandering child, come back home. It's your frail ship, boat, back, adrift on life's raging sea. 
Are you tossed on his billows and fold? There's a safe harbor home waiting out for you. If you are well, come back home. Wandering child, come back home. You come back in your mind. You come back in your heart. You come back with repentance. Say, Lord, I am sorry for going far away from you. I'm sorry for abandoning the thing you have called me to do. Lord, I come back home. The Lord is pleading with you today. Hear this gentle voice as it beats you no longer to roam. To that dear father's house, haste, come back without delay. Don't let the chastening of the Lord, the chastisement of the Lord increase in your life. Come back home. Come back to where the Lord has placed you. Don't allow pride to seal your doom. Wandering child, come back. Surrender yourself completely to the Lord. Don't have a misrepresentation, misinterpretation of the storm. The chastisement, the pressure, the difficulty raging in your life is God's divine intervention. So that you'll think upon your way. So that you'll think upon your life. Then you will yield and surrender to the Lord. Thy will, O Lord, be done. Not my will, but thine be done. Will mortal man fight against God? Will mortal man strive against his maker? Why don't you come back to the Lord? Why don't you surrender yourself completely to the Lord and say, Lord, your will I will do the whole of my life for the rest of my life. There's no joy in rebellion. There's no joy in running away from the Lord. There is no joy. There's no blessing. Is shifting away from the center of the will of God for your life. Say, Lord, here am I. I come back to you. If you have totally backslid and gone into sin, you repent of your sin. And you will tell the Lord to forgive you. And it will restore to you the joy of salvation. And then your heart will be soft. Your life will become tender. You'll be responsive and sensitive to the will of God, the way of God. You give your hand to the hand of the Lord. Lord, lead me to the place it pleases you. How it pleases you. And I will do only that that pleases you. You commit yourself, you consecrate yourself unto the Lord. And the Lord will have mercy upon you. Return, the Lord says, come back unto me. Yield unto your God. There's any particular sin you have been holding on to, you surrender them, you turn away from them. Are you being enslaved by a lady? Enslaved by a sin partner? Enslaved by a man? Break yourself loose. Come out of that unclean, dirty, defiling, adulterous relationship. And surrender yourself to the Lord. Is it a fraudulent business? Unlawful gain? That is tying you down. And you are thinking of what you will lose if you come out of it. Why don't you just surrender yourself to the Lord? 
and say, Lord, I surrender to you. The Lord has a thousand and one ways to bring you back. But don't, don't allow him to use a storm. While his gentle voice is calling to you, come back home. Come back to the Lord and surrender yourself fully to the Lord. And he will receive you. And he will abundantly pardon. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. A merciful God. A loving God. A gracious God. And whosoever comes to me, Christ said, I will in no wise cast away. If you come back to the Lord in repentance, if you come back to the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, fully yielded and fully surrender to the Lord. He knows the condition of your heart. If you are tender and yielding, submissive and surrendered unto him, he'll take you back. He'll forgive your past. He'll cleanse all the stain, all the sin out of your life. Make you clean. To make you pure. And then he will look at you graciously. As if you never sinned in your life. And he still commission you again. And still send you again to do his will. What he wants you to do. And empower your life. Don't strive with your Redeemer. Don't strive with your Maker. Say, Lord, I yield. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I give myself completely unto you. Your will to obey. Your will to do. Your work to do. To walk in the ways of the Lord. Let his word have authority and power in your life. Surrender to the Lord. He'll take you back as his child, take you back as his chosen vessel. 